so welcome to those who are new to the last Malaysian Research Insider session with a special focus on climate change. And to those who have joined us last Saturday, welcome back. So I'm Apple, I'm doing my PhD in Molecular Plant Science in University of Edinburgh. So this science chat is co-organized by Ambios, 100 Sciences of Malaysia, and our media partner, Science Media Center in Malaysia. And let's welcome our scientists today, Jasmine. Uh, she's a climate and environment consultant at UNICEF Malaysia. So I'll let you uh, introduce yourself further. So over to you. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jasmine. Nice. Okay. Um, hi, uh, my name is Jasmine. And uh, today I'll be sharing with you on navigating through the science and policy interface of climate change. So right before... Um, me having this talk, I actually got in touch with the organizer, Alia, to ask her like, hey, like, what are your expectations? Sort of like me trying to put together a framework for this talk because when she sent me the brief and the email and as I was looking through the previous speakers list, like almost more than 90% of them has a PhD or is doing their PhD. So I'm like, what am I doing here? Um, and she just told me like, you know what, Jasmine, um, we are really interested for you to share on your experience and journey. Um, so that is exactly what I'm trying to do here today. And um, Apple also reminded me that it's supposed to be a chill session. So hopefully um, this would be sort of like a chill talk for you. Um, I'll be sharing on a non-linear, unconventional, um, non-traditional pathway that I took uh, after my degree. Um, honestly, I am part nervous, part excited for this talk because this is my first talk after I finish my master's. Um, and I'll be sharing something with you guys, something that I've not shared publicly in my previous talks before. So yeah, let's go. Um, climate change. Let me, okay. So um, basically this is the relationship, how it started and how it's going. Um, started in um, back at the early 1800s. Um, and as you can see, this is actually called the Climate Stripe. Um, it is done by a professor at University of Reading called Ed Hawkins. And essentially what it shows is that a transition from the color blue to the color red, um, and for obvious reasons, um, it is how the climate has been changing um, from back then until now, and blue indicates um, a cooler temperature. Um, and red indicates a hotter temperature. So just a bit of introduction um, for myself. Um, you guys have seen uh, the poster that MBIOS have beautifully prepared for me. Um, just a run through of content, very existential question. Who is Jasmine? Where did she study? What does she do? A bit of climate and bridging the uh, science and policy interface. So this is where I studied my secondary years um, at SMK Convent Bukit Nanas. It is located in the heart of Kuala Lumpur. And as you can see from the resolution of the pictures, it is quite an old picture. Um, and I have no idea why back then um, we took pictures of our shoes. And it's definitely something where kids nowadays could never relate. Um, but back in my secondary years, I spent most of my time outside of classroom and on the field. Um, I was part of the hockey team. This is um, my amazing teammates, um, which I am friends with together until today. Um, when I'm not on the field, um, I'm either on the mat. Um, you can see me. Um, I'm a flyer cheerleader um, on sports days. Um, that's my house, Adele, and at cheer comms, um, I'm with Xavier. Um, there's a story why Xavier on that particular year is red and not green, um, but that's a story for another time. When I'm not on the mat, I'm on the stage, either acting, singing, dancing. Um, and also mostly out of my classroom experience is me getting involved in environmental related initiatives with um, mostly my classmates, um, people from my cohort. And this is a program that I took part in back in 2011 called Anugra Hijau, um, and it is organized by Econites. Um, and this is the usual roadblock where I feel most of you have encountered uh, what to do after high school. 
So I did okay-ish uh, for my SPM, not great. I took 10 subjects, um, I scored seven A's. Um, and fun fact, the A's that I missed um, was actually my science subjects. I was in my science stream and I did not get an A for either biology, chemistry or physics. So, I mean, at that point of time, I'm like, okay, there goes my future. Um, but I actually took some time, uh, took some break to actually really think about what I want to study for my undergraduate because at that point of time, I did not really make up my mind yet. Um, but one of the universities that I was looking at to do my foundation was in um, University of Nottingham, Malaysia. Um, and another fun fact, I actually enrolled in the University of Nottingham, Malaysia in foundation in arts. Um, mostly because like, okay, I did not score great um, in my science subjects. Maybe like, you know, arts is the route for me. Um, but then after discussing a bit with my dad, um, being a typical Asian parent, and he's also an engineer, he's like, Kaka, um, don't you want to do engineering? And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> and then um, he asked again, um, and he put it really simply in a sense that, um, you know, um, grades don't define you, your knowledge does. Um, and when you want to pursue something, um, particularly um, educationally, once you study science, it's really easy to apply it um, in an arts field. But if you start off studying arts, um, then it's really hard for you if you want to proceed with um, studying science later. Um, so that sort of um, makes sense for me at that time. I'm like, oh, okay, so wise. Uh, so <laughs> I actually looked into um, the science options um, that Nottingham have. Um, and if you have attended my previous talks before, I normally tribute um, my grandfather, who is a forester for my upbringing being very um, outgoing in nature and also have a deep appreciation for nature. Um, and I think it's something that is subconsciously embedded in me that I did not realize. And I stumbled upon a course called Environmental Science. Um, these are my amazing classmates. Um, we're a very small class of 11 people. Um, and when I started my degree in Nottingham, it was actually under the School of Biosciences. Um, so yeah, very relevant to this talk. I started my pathway in biosciences, but it's pretty interesting where it has led uh, me to be where I am now. Um, and under environmental science, uh, we have a lot of classes together with um, biotechnology, plant science. Uh, we spend a lot of time, uh, a lot of our time outdoors. This is during on one of our uh, field trips. Uh, you know, I always joke like, oh, y'all tag people on Instagram and I'll be out there tagging trees. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> um, during my time in Nottingham, I have three activities where I really, it really shaped me and really impacted me throughout my time there. And one of them is being part, uh, selected to participate in the first cohort of YCLE uh, back in 2014, which is a Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative. Um, so we were a bunch of, I think about 20 of us were selected um, from around ASEAN and I was based at the East West Center in Hawaii. Um, and throughout the program, you have this thing where you have to deliver a home project. So basically after your five weeks in the States, um, you are being trained, you bring taught, you attend classes, you have immersive experiences, and then they ask you like, okay, based on what you've been here, like what are the things that you can contribute back home? So my project was actually on low carbon transportation, and I was looking really into cycling as the alternative mode of transportation. Um, and I did a lot of case studies where I went to universities to see what are their options in terms of bicycle rentals. And I also visited third cities where, which had bike sharing systems. Um, and later you could see why this, is, this has impacted me um, throughout my years in Nottingham. The second activity was when I volunteered uh, with Engineers Without Borders in 2015. Um, we went to Kampong Safit in Sarawak. Uh, we spent about Two weeks there, off grid, um, no line at all. My mom was so worried about me, but I had to assure her that mom, I'm okay. Um, and what we did was they actually uh, built micro hydros. You can see in the bottom right here. 
um, as a sustainable mode of um, energy to be uh, transmitted to the kampong. Um, it's quite rural, I would say, uh, far off from the city of Kuching and from the base of the kampong, it's actually like a two hours hike up and um, the jalan to go up to the kampong is literally just passable by, by one motorcycle. So you literally just had to hike up to get to the kampong. And you can see like how we have to bring our, um, all, of, all of our stuff uh, through uh, yeah, bridges uh, like this. And yeah, it was, it was quite exciting. Um, and then the third activity, which is um, the bicycle project. So as a follow through from uh, my visit to the States uh, for my exchange program, I co-founded the UNMC Bicycle Project and also the Cycling Club. Um, also, um, going towards my final year, like I made a bunch of friends who similarly had the same interest as I do in terms of cycling. Um, and one particular encounter uh, which sort of gave me the push to start this. Um, so Nottingham, we have this exchange student program or transfer student program with the other two campuses, which is the UK and China. So um, I was riding my bike, my bike's name is Patrice, um, around campus and um, I, someone just stopped me, like this exchange student from the UK and he asked me like, hey, where can I rent a bike? And I was like, what? It's like, yeah, where can I rent a bike? Like you're cycling around campus, like where can I rent one? And I'm like, actually, I don't know. Um, which actually got me thinking there is so much demand for cycling, um, but you know, there is no allocated um, or, or, or service that is being provided um, in university. And mind you, this was actually before O-Bike happened. Um, and it was a, a very, it, it was an idea that was very fresh, um, something that I had to pitch to the upper management and something where we really need to kickstart the ground going. Um, also, some turning points in my final year from environmental science, like Apple, you asked me earlier, like, you know, you studied environmental science, like, how do you end up where you are today? Um, two things, um, going towards my final year um, in university, I was also involved with this sustainable research network. Um, and during one time, we had a trip to Sunway University where Professor Jeffrey Sachs was giving a talk. Um, this was back in 2013, and he was actually launching his book called The Age of Sustainable Development. I remember sitting um, in the hallway um, because the first, um, the first auditorium was actually full. We had to go into like the second auditorium, and he wasn't even live. I couldn't even see his face. I just saw him on the screen, but he was talking about Anthropocene. So basically how like we now live in an era where climate change is human induced, human caused, and it's not just a natural phenomenon. Um, yeah, so something about his talk just literally like sparked something in me. I'm like, wow, I want to know more on this and I want to learn about it. Um, I was a broke student. He was signing um, books, but during that particular time, I didn't have enough cash. Um, and what I actually did was we, we used to have brim, right? It was like um, book vouchers where we can um, use it for books. So the next brim cycle, um, I pre-ordered this book from Kinokunia and I used the cash to buy the book and I've been using the book ever since uh, for citations in my universities. Um, and it's all, it was also the year where um, the Paris Climate Agreement um, was being put together um, and I've had seniors from my university who attended the very sexy climate talk in Paris um, and that sort of inspired me as well because when I looked at them and their updates I'm like wow like I want to do that too like I want to be able to go to UN conferences and take part and share my views as a young person so that's the summary of my education years um, when I and when I when I touched earlier on having a very non-conventional, non-traditional pathway, um, it's also because I spent uh, three years working before doing my master's. And okay, let's just dive a bit more into that. Okay, let's not use the word spent uh, because I feel like I did not lose anything in that three years. Instead, I gained and I earned those three years to work and explore. Uh, I spent a few months uh, with Public Bike Share. Uh, it's actually Malaysia's first bike sharing system located in Malacca. Um, and this is where I learned a lot on the 
dealing with local government and also working in a startup space. Uh, but then after a while, I thought like, I actually really wanted to go into research because I wanted to do my master's. Um, and, I, and then I saw an opening at USM in Penang. Um, and without thinking, I just applied. Like, I did not know what's the background of it. They, they opened a RA position. All I knew is that I wanted to go into research. Um, this is probably the last time I wore a lab coat, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, so when I was at USM, I was based at the School of Educational Studies, also doing a lot of work with a School of Technological Industry on nature-based solutions. Um, and it's where I published most of my papers. Um, and then another opportunity came up. So sort of my philosophy in life is that, you know, when an, an opportunity arises, be open to it um, and don't just like say no if it's not something that appeals to you, you know. Uh, so another opportunity came up where I was invited to give a talk um, for the launch of Expo 2017 um, Astana, Kazakhstan. Um, so I flew down um, from Penang to KL because it was quite last minute and it was officiated by uh, Raja Muda Selangor um, and they were actually looking for like young people to communicate and also talk about um, green growth and also renewable energy. This was leading up to the um, exposition and uh, yeah somehow they got in touch with me and say like um, Desmond would you be interested to take up the position and I'm like yeah why not and next thing I knew, um, I was on a plane to Kazakhstan. And as you can see, I was uh, sitting in the media row with like fancy cameras. And my role was actually in social media and communications. Um, having a science background really helped me in terms of communicating very technical, very complex um, theories or also concepts into a layman um, understanding. So that's where I, um, that point of time was where I felt like my, you know, my degree was actually very valuable. <laughs> um, and coincidentally, while I was managing um, participants from Malaysia that came over to Kazakhstan, um, by the way, this was actually, um, it was an effort under the Ministry of, at that point of time, PETA, um, Kementerian uh, Technology Hijau dan AI, uh, Green Technology and Water. Um, and there were representatives from the Jeffrey Sachs Center who attended um, the session and I talked to one of the researchers. Um, she was asking me like, what am I doing after this? What are my plans? And I'm like, actually, I don't know because I know this is a short term project and I don't know where I'm going next. And then she's like, oh, um, why don't you try applying to the Jeffrey Sachs Center? And I'm like, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> so that's sort of where I ended up at the Jeffrey Sachs Center. And remember my earlier um, where I shared about Jeffrey Sachs. So this was like sort of surreal to me. I'm like, wow, like from something that I read in books to someone that I'm working closely with, it's a bit like I've never something that I've never saw coming. Uh, but I really like working with the Jeffrey Sachs Center. Um, I did a lot of research. I led the FABLE project, which is a food, agriculture, biodiversity, land use, and energy. The acronyms I tell you a lot. Um, and also I did a lot of fun stuff on like sustainable development and also um, climate change adaptation. Um, and mind you, on top of all that, I was actively involved with the Malaysian youth delegation. Uh, probably this is where a lot of my works translates into action. Um, I joined the Malaysian Youth Delegation in 2016 um, after I heard about the Paris Agreement and after I heard about my seniors uh, participating in the UN conferences. Um, yeah, so I joined, attended training series, capacity building series, um, wrote a bunch of articles, organized a bunch of sessions and persevered and hustled and made my way through. Um, I, so far, I've attended two um, UN climate change conferences. This is one of them, um, 2017 in Bonn, Germany. Um, and I feel like this is like the point where something within me was like, um, I wanted to do more work with the UN. I just find the institutionalization and the framework pretty interesting, especially um, me coming from a civil society movement and my role within um, the UN, but also, you know, how the UN further facilitates um, other countries for commitments and also um, enhanced participation. 
So it, it was something that um, sort of like fueled me to work with the UN and also do something with the UN. Yeah. Um, also, as a young person, I realized that uh, politicians and people in power and leaders uh, really need to act now and take action. Um, this is um, a meme by um, a very famous climate activist. I wrote her name down. Jamie Marklin. Yeah, you guys could look her up. Um, this is a very funny meme. But then, like, you know, we need leaders to stop encouraging young people but listen and act upon their words because somehow these young people know what they're talking about. Um, and then now, um, let me share a bit with you on my journey at Columbia. Um, so I feel like my journey before sort of led me to this. Um, I started Columbia last September, 2019. Honestly, 2020 has been such a long year. Timeline is fuzzy, uh, but I applied to do my master's in climate and society specifically, specifically because I feel like I really wanted to know more about the climate science and also how it impacts policy and also um, create societal change. It is a very interdisciplinary program under the Earth Institute. Um, and just let me share a bit on Columbia University. It is located in New York. Um, so as an undergraduate, if you want to apply to Columbia University, I read that it is the second most hardest Ivy League to get into with an acceptance rate of 5%. But um, that does not apply to graduate studies because you have a different um, application route that you um, go, go through. So for us as graduate students, we apply straight to the school and it's totally different than um, undergraduate acceptance. Um, yeah, so Columbia University, you may think like, hey, it looks a bit familiar. Um, it's because it is uh, quite famous. Uh, if you've watched Spider-Man or if you watch Gossip Girl, you have definitely seen Columbia University um, on your screen um, and also is located just about like 20 minutes subway right from New York City, Bright Lights, Big City, Concrete Jungle, where dreams are made of. <laughs> Um, yeah, so right before I flew off, I had a lunch appointment with a friend and she was so excited for me. She's like, Jasmine, you're going to New York, Broadway, so fun. Um, and honestly, that was at the back of my mind because um, the reason why I really wanted to go there was because of this. Um, this is the United Nations headquarter um, in New York. Um, it's somewhere where I've always wanted to visit, um, but have never had the means or capacity to do so. Um, and it's actually one of the places that I visited right after um, I arrived uh, at university. And on top of that, um, I have been working primarily as a researcher for most of my working years and enrolling myself into the program. I also had the opportunity to take up um, research positions. Um, part-time uh, as part of my program. So it's called the GRA position, which is the Graduate Research Associate. Um, so I have done quite a number of research, so which is why like when someone asks me, like, Jasmine, what are you researching on? You have to specifically ask me, like, which one are you referring to? Um, in fall, I was with the IRI, which is the International Research Institute on Climate and Society. Uh, spring 2020, I was, um, this was quite interesting. Um, Climate, uh, Center for Climate Systems Research, and also it was sort of like a dual appointment because that research center was actually based at um, NASA GIS, which is the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Um, and also in summer, uh, I did my internship at UNDP. Uh, quite a whirlwind of a year because COVID-19 happened. Uh, but as you can see, like a bulk of my research experience falls in the intersection of food systems and climate change. Um, but I feel like, you know, my interest more lies in climate policy and international um, climate policy as well. Um, so let's talk a bit about COVID because I feel it's something that a lot of us experience, but it's not really being talked about. Um, and for me and my classmates, it really 
sort of impacted us because it was only a one year program. And imagine doing half of my degree at home. Um, I had to come back um, mid March because my dorms was actually badly affected. Um, living in New York City, um, and this is, I feel like I'm not exaggerating this, um, the situation there at the height of COVID was really scary. Um, I was living in a dorm called the International House, and it actually housed graduate students from um, different universities in New York, so not just Columbia, but also universities like Juilliard, Manhattan School of Music, NYU. Um, yeah, so when COVID happened, like we knew if someone got infected, like it would really spread really quickly. And at that point of time, I've already heard rumors that people were getting sick. Um, so I made the decision to come home. And as I arrived home, um, I heard news that there was actually death cases involved um, due to COVID. And these are graduate students um, in the dorm. Um, it was really sad, really unfortunate, but that was the reality of it. Um, and the dorms had to shut down. Um, so for those of you who graduated this year, I feel you because it happened to me too. Um, what was the expectation of having a very fancy convocation on campus? Um, the reality is I woke up at 3 a.m. during Pwasa month and I made my family oh my God. Out at 3 <laughs> so a.m. during Pwasa month as well. No, like, they are more than willing to wake up. Um, and this black rope is actually my dad's graduation rope back in 1992. Wow. He dug it up for me. Um, and he's like, I can't wear this. I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> it was so underwhelming because literally the screen where you can see my name being displayed, it was pre-recorded and all you have to do is hit the play button. <laughs> oh, really? Wait, oh, yes. I see. Yeah, so it wasn't really a live person. It was pre-recorded and it was so underwhelming um, but that was my graduation experience yeah so just to recap um, that was my work timeline and normally when I share this with people no, actually I've not shared this with people this is something that I actually wrote in my uh, personal statement that my years post um, undergraduate studies and going into working life is my years of growth um, it's where I learned the most but going through graduate school and also postgraduate school is my years of nurture, which is where I want to nourish and flourish as a person, taking into account um, the skills and the knowledge that I've gained the past couple of years and how do I fully utilize it? How do I best translate it into good work and action? Um, I'm not sure of the time right now, but just diving in a bit of climate change because that's why we're here. <laughs> um, what we know about climate change. Um, understanding the global warming of 1.5 Celsius. Um, you've heard about the Paris Agreement and the Paris Agreement asked us to lower the um, global carbon uh, emission rate um, to two degrees, preferably 1.5. Um, and why 1.5? Um, the science says so. Uh, this is based on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You can see the historical data where um, it's mostly anthropogenically led and these um, are the projections in the future. Um, and this could be a bit too much for some of y'all to take in. Um, so let me just break it down on the impacts of why we need to limit our future to a 1.5 degree Celsius. Um, and a 0.5 degree Celsius makes a lot of change. For example, if you are sick, your normal body temperature is about 36.7, uh, but if you increase it to 0.5 or just one Celsius, um, you have a fever. So that is similar to global warming and the climate risk um, that we were about, we are about to face if you don't limit our global temperature rise to 1.5 or two. And um, the difference is actually really huge. This is a really interesting infographic by WWF, uh, which breaks down what is being laid out in the IPCC earlier. And just narrowing it on um, into the IPCC, this is sort of a very brief timeline of international climate negotiations. Um, you can see the IPCC, which is a science-based body organization um, which fits in into what we know now as of today. 
it started in 1988. Um, and you can see the UNFCCC, which is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, is adopted um, in 1992. Um, and after that is where the UN climate change negotiations happen year by year. Um, these are some of the protocols and agreements um, that were being made throughout the years. Um, and most significantly is the Paris Agreement, which is in 2015. Um, and the IPCC 1.5 report um, was released in 2018. Um, narrowing a bit more into a Paris Agreement, which was, um, uh, which was in 2015, um, what are countries looking forward to post-2015? So right now, the ongoing process is called the global stock take, and also where each countries have to revise their climate, uh, climate pledge. So NDCs are the nationally determined contributions, um, which was submitted back in 2015. And every five years, they have to um, resubmit uh, a more ambitious target than the five years before. So Malaysia is currently uh, in the process of preparing their updated NDCs and it is right now being done under the Ministry of Environment and Water, which is CASA, um, and it is um, expected, I think, um, by the end of the year. Um, but of course, um, because of COVID, a lot of things have been pushed back. Um, so there might be delays in the process as well. And this is not just for Malaysia, but internationally uh, for other countries too. And you may have heard in the recent years, there has been a rise in climate action movements, uh, specifically um, from the young. Um, and you can really tell that there is a frustration um, in terms of things are not, getting done as fast as they need to. Um, so uh, 2019, 2018, um, during the COP in Poland, uh, Greta Thunberg gave a very inspiring speech um, at, the, at the conference, um, which called for um, accelerated actions from world leaders. And this then sparked movements uh, by young people um, called Fridays for the Future, where global strikes happen globally. Um, and also in Malaysia, we have seen global strike, uh, climate strike movements on the ground um, in the recent years. Um, so why are young people so frustrated? Why are young people angry? Um, they're angry with the cause. Um, and maybe it's time for us to listen to them. Um, so if those few slides were a lot for you, let me just summarize it into three quick things. Um, what we know about climate change, one, is the science is clear. They made the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. If not, we are going to suffer catastrophic changes in the future, making the world to be very unsafe, um, very unjust for um, our future generations. Um, secondly, frameworks exist, um, and this could be reflected by international climate agreements. Um, but how do we translate it on the ground? How do we translate it into national commitments? How do we um, get actions to happen? Which leads me to the third point is that we have to do something about it. Um, and we do have the means, we do have the resources. Um, what we need is courage to take action upon what we already know. And with that, um, leading up to the present now, um, I am currently uh, with UNICEF as a climate and environment consultant. Um, and I am trying to address this very three big overarching questions, um, narrowing it down into a very local scale, um, a very national scale in Malaysia. Um, sort of trying to see like how um, different levels of um, government's work and also like what are the roles where civil society organizations can take part in specifically for the youth and for the children um, in Malaysia. So um, sort of like mapping out stakeholders, um, identifying key events, campaigns, trends and gaps, and how do we ensure child sensitive climate policies for rights to a safe, clean and sustainable environment for um, young people and also children. Um, and with that, uh, this is my favorite meme, 
uh, it says no climate don't change your sexy. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, excuse the questionable um, tweet handle, uh, but if you're interested to keep up with me, um, my tweet handle or my Instagram handle is my name, Jasmine Irisha. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jasmine. That's quite cool. So, um, you know, when you mentioned that uh, your friends take, uh, like you take photos of trees, like do you call yourself a tree hugger back then? <laughs> <laughs> that is a, actually a very common question that I get um, when I was studying my degree in environmental science. Um, not a lot of friends understood um, what I was doing or what I was studying. Uh, so the most common uh, comments that I got was like, oh, so what do you actually do? Like, do you go out and help trees? I'm like, no, no, I don't. I do a lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so is your bicycle project still running now? Do you know in Nottingham? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think it may have died down. Um, I last visited campus, I believe, back in 2018. Um, and at that point of time, um, they actually had old bikes on campus. But before that, um, I was engaged um, with the upper management of the university in terms of um, outreaching and also sourcing um, what kind of like bikes that we can get on campus. They were looking into like, um, you know, those battery yeah. bicycles. Yeah, because um, I think it was quite hilly, the guts of the like, I mean, they're easy to steal, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So they were actually um, looking through a couple of options. Um, I may be wrong. I have not um, followed up like what's going on now. I've been quite out of touch. Uh, but I mean, sometimes like, you know, you just have to start something. Um, yeah. But also secondly, you know, think about the sustainability of it. Um, when I left in 2016, um, there was still a group of students who were taking charge of the project. Um, but then after that, I'm not really quite sure what happened. Yeah, that's fine. Um, you know, you talk about, uh, you showed a picture about um, the youth protesting for climate mm -hmm. change in other mm -hmm. countries. Because I'm in the UK for a long time, I don't really know what's happening in Malaysia. So like, do you, are the youth in Malaysia doing it enough right now? Have they been protesting um, for climate change? Um, yeah, so for that, we actually have a um, youth climate organization in Malaysia, which organizes the climate strikes. Um, they're called KAMI, uh, Klima Action Malaysia. They've been very active in educating people and advocating on climate and climate justice. Nice. Um, you can look them up on social media. They do really interesting work. And also I love their uh, bilingual work as well. Uh, they do a lot of outreach in Malay, mm -hmm. um, also with the Orang Asli, uh, which I think is very much needed and which is quite lacking still in Malaysia. Nice. So it's called Kami, right? Yes. Cool. So um, Hakim has a question. So what are your opinions regarding the palm oil industry in Malaysia? Do you think it's sustainable? In terms of what? <laughs> I guess so because like a lot of countries in the EU, they've like mm -hmm. tried to ban products that, that contain um, palm oil. I think the States as well, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm just asking for your opinion. Um, mm -hmm. Is it sustainable, the palm oil industry? So as for palm oil, I'm not sure I'm the best person to comment on this since I don't really do much research on palm oil, but mm -hmm. it do derive a chunk of, um, it, it, it really helps Malaysia in terms of their economy. And also we have a lot of products um, deriving from palm oil as well. Um, I'll talk about like when it becomes unsustainable. Mm -hmm. So palm what we need in Malaysia is that we have to preserve our natural forest. Um, right now, like our, our pledge is to preserve at least 50% of our natural forest. Um, and we have to commit to that because we are not, re not just responsible nationally, but also globally for our targets as well. Mm -hmm. um, so as long as we keep on track with that, um, we do really need to um, get our focus straight in terms of uh, forest conservation and preservation. Um, and then only, uh, and then only we, we could say that hey, we we are committed to our targets, and that um, this is what Malaysia is currently doing right now. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, Jake has a question. So uh, in, in order for the public to understand the impacts of climate change, um, is the data like mortality rates of vulnerable groups, um, are they accessible to the public? That's a really good question. Um, when it comes to data, um, not just um, in health, but also in climate data in terms yeah. of carbon emission. Um, for, so for in terms of um, climate data and carbon emission, like where we, uh, the sectors identified with um, our uh, greenhouse gas emissions, you can actually find them in uh, Malaysia's biannual update report. Um, it's a report that is being released in CASA and is also being um, reported back to the UNFCCC. So if you refer back to that, um, you can easily find um, Malaysia's climate data, official climate data. Um, as for mortality and I can't remember what's the other thing that you asked on. Just follow vulnerable groups. Like okay, for or maybe. Right, right. Um, so I realize there is there's not really much open source data uh, when it yeah. comes to specific um, or targeted groups, um, a database on that. Um, I would need to look it up, but if anyone else here is an expert on it, feel free to jump in. <laughs> There's a bioinformatician in the Zoom call, so <laughs> Danka I might have to <laughs> ask you for help on that. <laughs> Extracts of data. Um, so another question by Jake, um, he, he asks, um, do you reckon uh, the investment in climate change research is going up or down in Malaysia in the recent years? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, so for everyone's information, uh, Malaysia has set up a climate change center under Green Tech oh. Malaysia, um, which is actually um, something that was initiated by the previous MESTEC minister, the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology, Energy and Climate Change, um, UBN. Um, and it is anticipated that a lot more research uh, will be ongoing on climate change. Um, so perhaps it is something that um, we could keep track of and like look into because I feel that there's going to be a lot of um, exciting initiatives and also activities under yeah. the centre um, in the coming years. Yeah, for sure. So tying into that, um, Alaya has a question. So does Malaysia have any big uh, long-term goals for tackling climate change? Yeah, so we do have a national climate change plan um, 2009. Um, we don't have something radical like the mm -hmm. Green New Deal, yeah. um, which is something that is worth looking into um, for Malaysia. Um, but other than that, um, we, we have our NDCs, which we are trying to update, uh, which I mentioned earlier on the National uh, Determined Contributions, which is our climate pledge to the UNFCCC. Yeah. Oh, national plan. Okay, I might read up on that, actually. So I'm, I'm just curious, um, you did an internship with uh, UN Developmental, a development program, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what's your daily life like? How is research, because research for me as a scientist is basically doing like stuff in the lab. So what yeah. does it mean for you as a climate change intern? Huh. That's so interesting because like, um, so we all have this like perception of a scientist that you have to wear a coat and yeah. you have to do the lab, right? Uh, but like for me, like I don't do that. Um, and also for climate scientists, uh, we do a lot of climate modeling. Uh, we mm -hmm. look into like historical data and uh, we do a lot of um, either mathematical modeling or um, uses some sort of software to project um, what the future will look like based on um, uh, a number of factors that you would want to insert it into the model. Um, I always joke to people that, you know, um, not pretty enough to be a model, so I become a climate modeler <laughs> instead. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, climate scientists do a lot of modeling. Uh, but that was something that I studied um, in university, but yeah. not really applied um, in my current work. Um, in my current work, so based on my experience um, as an intern at UNDP, I started off my internship during the pandemic, which means I mostly work from home. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had a really encouraging supervisor, um, which was very patient and um, full of guidance. Yeah. And uh, we worked really well together. Um, and I sort of like came in having a, a set of like knowing what to do 
um, we discussed beforehand on like what are the job scopes will be like and what are the things that I would work on. Um, and the things that was being given to me was mostly working on my strengths, uh, which is um, climate policy, um, youth action. Um, so it's sort of like merging those two together. We also carried out a national youth climate change survey, uh, which will be launched uh, really soon. So um, you guys should follow UNDP Malaysia and uh, keep track of their progress and um, really, really exciting um, data outputs from the survey. Cool, I'm quite excited. So guys, follow UNDP Malaysia. Yeah, and it was also um, jointly done together with UNICEF, um, which is where I am right now. Uh, so some of our work uh, do uh, have common grounds in between. Uh, so we are very uh, supportive of one another and uh, what we do in terms of climate and environment as well. Yeah, so uh, Peru have a, has a question that's quite um, uh, similar to um, well, that touches on your current um, job, which is, mm -hmm. um, do you engage with a lot of ministers or, or the public to educate them on environmental issues? Or is it mainly just consultancy? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. So right now what I'm doing is um, I'm trying to map key stakeholders for um, local um, climate access in terms of um, those represented by children and youth organizations, right? Um, so one of the, following back through the National Youth Climate Change Survey, um, one of the things that we're trying to do is to highlight the importance of the voices of youth to be taken into account into our country's climate pledge. Um, because right now, um, there is a lack of acknowledgement from vulnerable groups, which are children, youth, and indigenous groups. Um, so we are wanting to highlight that and the importance of it as well, because having that um, in our national climate pledge means that there is an amount of significance mm -hmm. and there is a amount of um, importance uh, moving forward in terms of what we need to do in Malaysia as a country. Um, yeah, so children and youth um, is... An, an, we're also lacking a lot of child-sensitive policies yeah. in Malaysia. Um, and I think this um, is this goes the same with like other fields as well, um, either it's medical field or whether it's um, the economics field. Like we, um, the policies and plans that are being laid out are often um, lacking their narrative or like even a perspective from a young person. So like, how do we ensure like intergenerational justice or intergenerational equity is being placed forward? if we are not acknowledging um, the voices of young people, the voices of children in the first place. Yeah, yeah. So um, are, are you pushing for climate change education to be included in school curriculum? Is that like one thing that um, you guys are looking forward to push? Actually, uh, the issue of climate change education is not a new issue. Um, it was actually, being discussed about like four years ago back when the Ministry of Environment was still NRE, Natural yeah. Resources and Environment. Um, it, it was something that was being pushed by uh, Minister Dr. Wan Junaidi. Um, I remember uh, sitting in a meeting with him and he was so keen on having the idea of a dedicated um, environmental education curriculum nice. um, within the national syllabus. Uh, but also understanding that uh, Malaysia's school syllabus often change really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I still have siblings in school, um, Lily and Johan, they're 12 and 14. Um, and sometimes they would tell me like, oh, okay, the syllabus changed again and again oh, and again. And like, they don't even know what to study for exam because sometimes <laughs> the teachers also don't know what to teach them. Um, yeah, so it, it's a really hard question to address, mm -hmm. I feel. Um, right now, uh, in Malaysia, climate change or environment um, is being seeped into um, subjects like geography or science, yeah. um, but there's no sole or dedicated curriculum for that. Um, and I, I think that it would take a while um, for it to happen. Yes, I mean, it, the thought is the thought that counts, right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. even though it's not really implemented now due to certain challenges, but at least um, there was uh, 
um, an initiative that um, they wanted to push for. So um, and a question by Adila, do you know Malaysia's status on sustainable development goals? Uh, are we on the right path? Yeah, so oh, on sustainable development yeah. goals. <laughs> There's so many. There's so many. That's why. Like, how many? Yeah, there's 17 SDGs. <laughs> and don't like get me started on the indicators and targets. It's about um, 100 plus and about like 222 um, indicators or targets. Yeah. Um, so what's interesting about the SDGs is that um, it's a plan um, that was being put together um, also during the Paris Agreement. Um, and together with the Paris Agreement was being born the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, so when I say, um, when, I, when I talk about the Sustainable Development Goals, it's supposed to be something that is being translated um, to the local level. Um, therefore, you can see a lot of like local governments taking initiative uh, on implementing the SDGs, but not just local governments, but also you can see like universities or yeah. um, businesses, businesses um, taking into account SDGs as well. Um, and I know like right now, um, if you're an organization applying for grants or like um, doing anything environmental related, like you have to sort of map it back to like which SDG target are you oh. hoping to achieve or um, based on like the sustainable development goals, like um, so that like, you have SDG 13 for climate action, for example. Um, and so these are the kind of things where it's very, one could say that it is high level, but at the same time, one could also say it's achievable. Um, there is no specific um, indicator. No, well, actually there is. Um, there's this traffic light indicator. I can't oh. remember um, which report it is in, but it basically shows like the health status of SDGs in different countries. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, for nice. Malaysia, like, like it will also narrow down like um, which uh, particular field or which particular issue is red, um, which is something that we need to um, we need we need to do better in or we need to address it more rather than the other fields. Yeah. Nice, nice. Uh, health indicator. That's quite cool. I should I should check it out later. I'm quite interested whether we're. Um, orange or green or red <laughs> yeah and if you want to read more about um, SDGs in universities uh, I wrote a paper about mobilizing the sustainable development goals in universities um, it's case studies of the um, projects that I've been involved in um, throughout the years uh, you can check it out as well <laughs> oh nice so um, like one question then so from that paper so what is the one SDG that we should really, really work on in Malaysia? I feel like we should, when we look at SDG, we should really look at what are we focusing on and um, what is the current, um, the most important thing um, that you would want within your field, right? So it is very cross-cutting. Mm -hmm. It is uh, very broad, actually. Uh, but ultimately, um, the main goal um, from, you know, researchers and also from papers um, is that if you want to tackle sustainable development, you should tackle no poverty because yeah. if you solve no poverty, then you can solve the rest. Yeah, that's why no poverty this is the first SDG, I would say. Yeah. But uh, I think I have one question for you, probably like right. the last two on, last two questions. Um, you know, being a climate change consultant is quite a niche feel. So okay. um, a lot of parents would be like, uh, does it really make money, you know, being a consultant, especially like a climate change consultant? So how, what would you advise to students who, who are interested in pursuing this field but get discouraged by their parents? Uh, first of all, I would say like for any one of you who are thinking about pursuing climate change as a study, I would fully encourage you to do so because there, we, have, we are lack of expertise and we are also um, lack of people who pursue climate change as, um, a, as, a, as, a, as a pathway or like as an educational degree subject. Um, well, um, on that note, there are actually a lot of areas where you can go into once you study climate change. 
Um, I might be biased on this because I study it and also I believe that climate change is a crisis and it's something that we should all, we need all hands on deck to solve the issue. Um, but also, um, we can't forget that climate change also interlinks with other bigger issues as well, such as health. Uh, we have a lot of transmitted diseases, um, airborne diseases because of climate change. Um, climate change means that the earth is getting warmer, um, places where our high precipitation are getting wetter, places which are warmer um, are experiencing more droughts. We have the California fly, uh, fires yeah. and then we have floodings that are happening. Um, so all this um, are just sneak peek of what is going to happen, with, uh, which are things that are going to worsen in the future. Um, and if we don't do something now, then it's just going to be continuously um, happening at a very unprecedented rate. Um, yeah, so climate change, um, it's, it's a environmental issue, it's a justice issue, it's a social issue. Yeah. Um, and you don't have to be a scientist to study climate change. Um, you, can, um, you can pursue a career in the social sciences as well. A lot of people are going to the humanities, going, yeah. looking into the societal um, aspect of it. A lot of people are looking into the health aspect of it. And a lot of people are even looking into the psychological aspect of it, right? Um, climate grief. Um, is something that I came across and is something that is very real. Um, we often discuss about it um, in class because some people, I mean, I guess for Malaysians, we are actually located in a very sweet spot where yeah. we don't really feel devastating effects of climate change. Um, but also I just want to highlight um, those living in small island nations. Um, for them, it's a livelihood issue. For them, in 50 years time, they would probably wouldn't have a home because sea level is rising um, at a very fast rate. Um, also, yeah, so climate migration is also happening. Um, that, it's a lot. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I, I can know. go on and on. I, know. I, should, I should stop. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Um, I mean, we're touching the one hour mark now. So thank you, Jasmine, for your great answers and your presentation. And thank you for the audience for joining us on our last uh, Research Insider session. This, So thanks, guys, for coming. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the session. <laughs>